starts right now. From legalizing the use of drones by Texas military forces to designated Mexican cartels as foreign terrorist organizations, Governor Greg Abbott signing several border security measures that went into effect on Thursday. The governor also announcing a new effort to try to keep migrants from crossing into the U.S. by using buoys. Jonathan Cotto tells us how border area nonprofits and some law enforcement agencies are reacting. What we're doing right now, we're securing the border at the border. What these buoys will allow us to do is to prevent people from even getting to the border. On Thursday, Governor Abbott signing six bills relating Senate to bill border security. Senate Bill 602 is now law in the state of Texas. And announcing his plan to deploy a chain of four-foot-high orange buoys that will run along the middle of the Rio Grande in an effort to keep migrants from crossing into the U.S. Mile after mile after mile of these buoys. The launch of the water barrier causing concern for some nonprofit organizations like La Unión del Pueblo Entero. It's not going to be that they're going to run into the buoys and they're going to decide not to try to cross them. And so we're worried primarily with that. How many migrants is this going to hurt? Or worse. The first to see the floating barrier, the border community of Eagle Pass. But it's not going to stop the immigrants. That's what I think. It's, it's gonna, they're still going to be looking for another place to go to cross. Schmerber, a former federal officer, says he was surprised the state would take this action. Because the river is, is, is actually owned by both sides. We have a treaty with Mexico, and I think anything that has to be done on the river has to be, I'm pretty sure, communicated with the country of Mexico. Also surprised, the International Boundary and Water Commission. We reached out to IBWC reps, who in a statement tell us their door is always open to discussions with Texas and have recently shared information with the state about their permitting process and federal law. They say they are studying what Texas is publicly proposing to determine whether and how this impacts their mission to carry out treaties between the U.S. and Mexico regarding border delineation, flood control, and water distribution, which includes the Rio Grande. The floating barrier is set to launch in July along the Eagle Pass border sector and is expected to cost millions of dollars. Another issue La Unión del Pueblo Entero is taking with this project, they say that money could be invested on roads, schools, and parks along the border that could improve the border economy. But instead, they say the money is being used to militarize the border. Reporting Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. And tonight, we know the name of the man found dead in the San Antonio River. The Bear County Medical Examiner says 62-year-old Roy Tavitas was actually found in the river near the King William District. San Antonio police say a jogger found his remains last Friday about 4 p.m. Officers say he was fully clothed with steel toe boots on. SAPD says there was no signs of forced trauma or injury. The medical examiner did not give a cause or manner of death. A San Antonio police officer who repeatedly punched a woman in the face during an arrest last year will be back on the job soon. Scott Marshall was handed a 30 day unpaid suspension for this December 2022 assault. This assault happened during a family disturbance arrest. Records state the female suspect hit Marshall while she was being arrested. He responded by hitting her 10 to 11 times with a closed fist while she was on the ground. Marshall was never charged. His unpaid leave started June 3rd. He'll return to duty on July 2nd, using one bonus day of paid leave to cover the full 30-day suspension. A man out on bond for evading arrest and drug possession has been arrested for the same charges. We're talking about 56-year-old Roy Ramsey. He's now facing six new charges, including felon in possession of a firearm, evading arrest, and drug possession. Windcrest police tried pulling over Ramsey. He drove off, abandoned his truck, that vehicle was then found. Officers say they found a gun, methamphetamine, and marijuana. Ramsey was arrested yesterday. His bond set at $90,000. A sweeping school security bill has passed the Texas legislature, now heads to Governor Greg Abbott's desk. It does not include gun control measures, but instead mandates armed security at every school campus in Texas. Courtney Friedman breaks down House Bill 3 and explains why some people and organizations are against it. House Bill 3 covers a lot of ground concerning school security. It strengthens the Texas School Safety Center, which disseminates safety information for all Texas schools. It requires annual audits of school protocol and requires more staff members to get mental health training. It has many um, provisions in it, some good, 
and many quite harmful. The main piece of the bill raising eyebrows mandates an armed security officer at every Texas school campus. We've talked to some experts who estimate that to put a armed police officer for every campus, it's going to be a minimum of seventy-five dollars to $100,000 per campus. Paige Duggins-Clay is the chief legal analyst at the Intercultural Development Research Association, or IDRA, a nonprofit civil rights group focusing on equal education opportunity. One main concern is funding. Is a school expected to forego a counselor, a bus driver, an educator in order to first fulfill that, that you know, armed security officer? The bill lists an exception for schools that cannot afford to hire an officer or don't have enough personnel to qualify as security officers. Those schools could arm a school district employee who gets training from a certified instructor. The bill did increase overall school safety funding by raising the allotment per student from $9.72 to $10. They added some school safety grants and allotted $15,000 more to each school. $15,000, not enough to pay for the personnel for an armed security mandate. IDRA has also argued studies show armed security on school campuses does not deter targeted shootings by individuals who are commonly suicidal. Plus, Duggins Clay has civil rights concerns. When um, police officers are stationed at our schools, Black, brown, and queer students are the ones who are disparately impacted. She says police officers stationed for emergencies often get involved in daily school discipline, ending in unnecessary violence. I did reach out multiple times to the bill's sponsor, Representative Tracy King, but still have not received a response. I did get a hold of an aide for Rep Steve Allison, who also supported the bill, but they decided not to comment. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. To Houston now, several people injured in a shooting outside of a nightclub there over the weekend. This happened early Sunday morning at the Taboo Restaurant and Lounge. Houston police say some sort of fight started inside the club, then continued out into the parking lot where someone opened fire into the crowd. At least six people were shot, all of them taken to a nearby hospital. At least one of those people in critical condition. Police say they aren't sure how many shooters were involved here. So far, no arrests have been made. Governor Greg Abbott also signing a law that will shake up the contents of school libraries. Starting September 1st, sexually explicit books will be taken off shelves and some books with sexual references will require parental consent for students to read. Book vendors must also now assign ratings to books similar to movie ratings. Critics of the law, though, say the language is too vague and could restrict books that aren't inappropriate. While supporters say students should be shielded from any kind of sexual material in school libraries. Well, it's something on the to do list that a lot of people don't want to do a car inspection. Right now, there's a bill ready for the governor to sign that would eliminate that annual inspection starting in 2025. Erica Hernandez explains what's in that bill and how it could affect a local business. Currently, Texas is one of 13 states that requires annual inspections of vehicles, but House Bill 3297 would do away with that rule. The Texas House and Senate have both signed off on the bill. It would still require the annual $7.50 fee, but you just wouldn't have to take the inspection test. 17 Texas counties that currently require emissions inspections would still mandate annual tests regardless of the bill, but Bear County is not included. And this bill can have serious consequences for places like this, John's inspections on the south side, who sees 20 to 30 cars a day. I don't think they should do it, and they're just going to hurt us. For more than 20 years, John Ellis and his daughter have operated their inspection station on South Flores. If there are no inspections to do, they not only fear for their business, but for the safety of drivers. So there's going to be out the cars out there that the brakes are going to be bad, the lights broken, whatever. It's for safety for everybody. Ellis hopes Bear County gets added to the list of counties that requires emission testing, but he hears that might not come until 2026. In the meantime, he holds out hope. Well, we just have to wait to see. That's what I'm doing, see what happens. Erica Hernandez, he's at 12 News. Look outside with live cam this evening. It is a hot one out there. And I think it's going to stay that way. <laughs> I'm no yeah. meteorologist. What? Let's ask him. I know. I just, but you, you are a wise woman. Yes, she <laughs> is. And it is June. We're creeping into the middle of June, and we're starting to feel the heat. 97 degrees. That was our high temperature today. The average being 92, a record 105 on this day. Katula topped out at 106. Laredo made it to 104. 
Meanwhile, Del Rio, a high temperature of 97 degrees, the same as San Antonio. And as we go through the evening hours, our temperatures will slowly fall off. 93 at 8 o'clock, still very sticky out there. 10 o'clock, 87. Then the low clouds will come in around before midnight and stick around through sunrise tomorrow. And speaking of the humidity, a lot of that's coming from our soil moisture. We'll look at the soil moisture content that we have and the forecast for the rest of the week, how much our ground is going to dry out and what that means for the humidity in just a little bit. Thank you, Adam. All right, let's go to I-35 at Loop 410 and you can see traffic moving along very smoothly where 35 and 410 come together near Windcrest. No major backups. That's a good thing. In a new case that explains the money of politics, it takes money to get elected. But have you ever thought about what happens to that money once a campaign is over? Ultimately, the responsibility of overlooking all of this is the community. Today's case that explains breaks down the rules or lack thereof in some cases that govern campaign contributions, including what a candidate or elected official can do with their donations if they decide to get out of politics. Case that explains is at 630. Straight ahead, though, on the News at 6, finding future talent, how aviation and aerospace leaders of today hope to inspire the next generation. Welcome back. I'm Stephanie Jimenez, and here's what we're working on for you tonight on The Night Beat. The concern with public safety on a public highway is that's intended for community use. It is illegal for you to take it over for your own racing concept because you never know who you're gonna hit, who you're gonna kill, uh, or who you're gonna hurt. Something we've seen way too many times in our community. This weekend, another street takeover landed three people in jail. New legislation signed by Governor Greg Abbott just days ago is hoping to break that trend tonight. How law enforcement here in Bear County plan to use that new law to stop street takeovers in our community. Also, you see it right there, summertime in South Texas. That means that most people are gonna be relying heavily on their air conditioning units tonight. How to keep your AC in tip top shape to get you through this summer heat. We'll see you for these stories and so much more tonight on the Night Beat. Thank you, Steph. Well, today students from Texas and Louisiana got the opportunity to learn about careers in aviation and aerospace. This morning, about 100 middle and high school students took part in the event at Port SA. The event part of the Tech Ports program called Project Leaders Inspiring Future Talent. Students at the event got to hear from aviation professionals about different careers and pathways. So I plan on going to the Air Force at the high school, so it's like it's going to be a milestone for me to learn about aviation and what goes on in a daily life with aviation. The students also participated in different workshops focused on flying, airports, even drones. More than $24 million in federal funding is going to the city and nonprofits to help reimburse costs from migrant arrivals. Congressman Henry Cuellar announced today the city of San Antonio, United Way and Catholic Charities will be getting compensated for helping provide relief for processing facilities. Here's how those $24 million will break down as part of the fiscal year 23 shelter and services program. In a statement, Congressman Cuellar said in part, quote, thank you to the city of San Antonio, United Way San Antonio, Catholic Charities of the Archdiocese of San Antonio and my colleagues in the San Antonio Congressional delegation for working with me to provide for our border communities end quote. Check out the weather out there right now. 95 degrees and we're just starting. Baking? Yeah, we're just starting really. I mean, it's 95. Yes, it's hot. Just wait. Mm -hmm. We're cooking, aren't we? Yeah. And it's not just hot, but it's also very humid. And this humidity is going to stick around for several more days. The heat high is pressing down on us and all the rain that we had has given us that high soil moisture content, which is boosting our humidity and no rain chances. Unfortunately, even with this humidity, we can't make rain. This is a look at the heat index, the feels like temperature and notice Catula feels like 112. Even Laredo feels like 112 Del Rio, a heat index of 109 in town here, 101. And this is the reason it's not just the heat, but of course the humidity, you know, typically by this time of day, the hottest part of the day, 
the dew points fall off and we often see them fall off into the lower 60s by this time of day, which offsets that heat index a little bit. Now it does cause the temperature to rise, but this is the main factor that we're dealing with right now. And this dew point, we're not getting a break from it because of that soil moisture that we have in place from all of the rain. The rain was great. It blessed us with the soil moisture. But now we're feeling it out there and we're not getting a break from it. The sun is just baking the ground and then that that moisture evaporates into the air and we feel that humidity. Now this is the a model analysis of soil moisture across Texas and with the very recent rainfall in North Texas, that's where you have the green colors indicating very damp soil. We're kind of in the middle right now because we are starting to dry out, but still our soil is damp enough to give us that humidity throughout the day. No break in the humidity as we would typically see now going forward in time. Notice how this week with the sun beating down on us, we do see that soil moisture start to dry out a little bit. And I do think that's going to offset the humidity some later on this week. So at least it'll start to turn into more of a dry heat. But remember, drier air heats up a little bit more. So when it comes to the feels like temperature, it's basically a wash. But notice our dew point trend for the afternoons. It looks like our dew points will get to the typical low 60s in the afternoons by Friday and Saturday as the ground starts to dry out a little bit more. So that's going to at least at least eliminate the humidity from the equation. Let's put it that way. But temperatures will go up a little bit. Temperatures right now 106 in Catula, 98 Pleasanton, 95 here in town. But notice to the north, quite a bit cooler. I mean, Lubbock is 75, even Abilene 80, Oklahoma City 64, Amarillo 69 degrees. It's not the entire Lone Star State dealing with the heat. There's actually a frontal boundary across North Texas that's going to linger all week. And you really don't, meteorologically speaking, don't have to go that far to get into some of that cooler air. And also, uh, decent rainfall and extra clouds from the rain contributing to those lower temperatures off to the north. But at least somebody's getting some needed moisture, and that's where the moisture is going to stay in the days ahead. North Texas and points northward up the plains, not around here, because we have the heat high settling in in turn. That's going to press down on us and Keep us dry, no chance of rain in sight because of that heat high. And I want to look at tomorrow before we get to the seven day forecast. Looking ahead to tomorrow, we'll start the day cloudy at 76 by noon, sunny in 88. And then by four o'clock, we're at our high temperature of 99, but it's going to feel like it's a 106 for a few hours in the afternoon and even higher heat indices farther south and southwest of San Antonio. We're all feeling it because of that rain and the moisture in our soil. Catula tomorrow 104, Carrizo Springs 105 along with Del Rio, Lavernia 100, Elmendorf high temperature of 99. We are predicting our first triple digit day officially in town by Wednesday and then probably record challenging heat up to 103 by Friday into this upcoming weekend. Coming up next half hour, we'll look at a bit of a comparison this year to last year in terms of the heat. All right. Thanks, Adam. All right. This guy is one of my favorite NFL players. Mm -hmm. You know why? Why? He <coughs> once came in the KSAT newsroom <laughs> and played office linebacker. Yeah. You remember was, that? Yes. That was before my time here, but I've seen the video. It was not before my time, Larry. Okay. Did he tackle you? Were you one of them? Uh, I don't think so. I think we just had like a conversation like as he was tackling somebody. Yeah, I want to <laughs> yeah. say I want to say someone. that he tackled Sears, right? Yes, I think so. Definitely. Sears, if you're out there, can you confirm that for yeah. us? Yes. Indy Kalu is an awesome guy. He's from Marshall High School, and you know what? He's coming back to town for a free football camp. Plus, we're going to take you to Brackenridge to introduce you to the Eagles' new head football coach coming up. I was also able to tour the grounds here at Cornerstone Christian High School because we're going to have a free football camp uh, June 24th. So this was my chance to finally see the facilities and I'm pumped to do it. Marshall High School alum N.D. Kalu is coming to San Antonio to host a free football camp in Big Board Sports.
Victor Wimbanyama bounced back from an off game in the LNB Pro A Finals, but his team lost again and trailed top seeded Monaco two games to none. After scoring just eight points in the first game, Wimby had 19 points today in the Metropolitan's 92 88 to 95 loss. Wimby added seven rebounds, four assists, three blocks, and two steals. Game three is Thursday in a potential elimination game for Wimby and his guys. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Lawford. The Houston Texans announced today that J.J. Watt will be officially inducted into the Texans ring of honor during the Texans game against the Pittsburgh Steelers on Sunday, October the 1st at home. Their former three-time defensive player of the year and Walter Payton man of the year is a third member to be inducted into the ring of honor, joining Robert C. McNair and Andre Johnson. Watt was the 11th overall pick in the 2011 NFL draft and he spent 10 seasons with Houston. We recently met up with former NFL defensive end N.D. Kalu while he was touring Cornerstone Christian High School, site of his free football camp Saturday, June 24th. N.D. went to Marshall High School, then Rice University, and then he played 12 seasons in the NFL, and he loves giving back to the 210. You know what, uh, I've always been all about San Antonio, San Antonio sports, even from the days when I was at Rice playing in the uh, NFL for 12 years. I always felt like any chance I get to come home and, you know, host a camp, teach football to the youth of San Antonio to do it. So, you know, no time like the present and just excited about teaming up with some whole high school teammates and uh, being able to put this camp out here. Yeah, we already have some uh, former NFL players. We actually have quite a few. Myself, uh, Priest Holmes, who also went to Marshall. Uh, he'll be at the camp. Eric Brown, who went to Judson, then he won a Super Bowl with Denver. He'll be at the camp. So a lot of uh, guys that came through San Antonio, played in the NFL, will be coming back to kind of share not just our stories, but the skill set and try to teach these kids how to play the right way. Those are some awesome former NFL guys to learn from. The event is free and registration is still open. The info is here for you on the screen. Sign up at ndkalufootballcamp.eventbrite.com. In big game coverage, Matthew Tony Manning was named head football coach at Brackenridge High School. Manning served as his first assistant and offensive coordinator for Roosevelt High School for the past 10 seasons and is replacing Larry Norman, who was hired to become the athletic director and head football coach at Cole ISD. And Coach Manning is excited for this opportunity. Yeah, I'm just humbled and honored and, and uh, appreciate the administration here at Brackenridge High School, along with the, the leadership at SAISD in the athletic department for giving me this opportunity. Uh, this place is, is rich in tradition. A uh, couple of state titles back in the day, uh, a big upside, some great kids, and I'm looking forward to working with them. Uh, admin team's been very supportive, uh, getting in on the hiring process right now. Kids are flying around having fun today. It's our first day out here. Uh, it's really excited. And his message for Brackenridge football fans, get your popcorn ready. I love it. The Eagles. Yes. Got a couple Eagles in there. Yeah. Andy Kalu. Yeah. Former Eagle. Mm -hmm. Current Eagles. Yep. Just different. Flying around in this sports cast, right? <laughs> yeah. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Larry, we are. <laughs> Thanks, Larry. <laughs> Up next, we are following the money in politics. Who keeps tabs on that money and what happens once a campaign ends? Case that explains is next. Election season is over in San Antonio, at least for now. All city council seats have been decided after the runoffs this weekend. Have you ever wondered what happens to the money that candidates raise once an election is over? That's what we found out in this case that explains, plus how campaign dollars are reported, but not necessarily checked. Public service requires private dollars. You need money to get elected. To run for office and start raising money, a candidate must first have a treasurer. A candidate must have filed a treasurer with the body that is handling that particular election. In many, many, many cases, candidates often will just appoint themselves as their campaign treasurer, and there's nothing wrong with that either. The treasurer does not have any responsibilities other than, other than having their name on the paperwork. It's the candidate who's responsible for ensuring that the reports are turned in, in a timely manner. Candidates have to report the money they raise and spend and where that money came from or went. It's not supposed to be used for personal expenses. The list of do's and don'ts is long and the line can be a little fuzzy. The candidate uh, can 
use their campaign funds to pay for childcare expenses, uh, to facilitate their travel in connection with having to participate in campaign events. At the state level, campaign finance rules are set by the Texas Ethics Commission. State level officials file their reports with us. Local officials file with local governments. When running for office, candidates must file one campaign finance report 30 days before election day, then another eight days before the election. Then, four days before Election Day, local candidates are required to stop taking donations. That is not a state rule, that's a city rule. Well, these donations do have to be deposited into a bank. That account must be separate from a candidate's personal bank account, but it can have their name on it. In San Antonio, there are campaign contribution limits. The state doesn't have any. So, a mayoral candidate can raise $1,000 from one person. So, like, you could donate to a mayoral candidate, $1,000, and then city council candidates are $500 limits. That's per person or entity. Even if a large company wants to donate directly to a candidate, it has to stick to that limit. And those limits are in place one year before election day. So if Max wants to donate the max of $1,000 to the potential mayor, he can do that only once in the 365 days before the election. What's different is uh, political action committees. Under law, it is uh, it is defined fairly broadly as, as any group of two or more people whose principal purpose is to uh, raise, accept political contributions or make political expenditures. PACs don't often donate directly to a candidate. If they do, the donation limits still apply. Money from a PAC can indirectly benefit a candidate or an issue through ads, for example. Remember Proposition A in the recent city election? Do you want to pay for the bills of shoplifters? You will if Prop A is passed. And there were several PACs that were formed against Prop A, and they were reported through our system. They had to do a 30-day report and an 8-day report, and we don't have contribution limits for PACs. So they could spend a million dollars on advertising if they wanted to. Yeah, I think they might have. <laughs> While the state and the city collect campaign finance reports, they don't check them. We take them at face value and we lock them down and we make them public. There is a statutory sort of randomized audit process where a percentage of the reports will be reviewed regardless of whether a complaint has been filed. But we're a small agency and we get many, many thousands of reports each year. We don't have authority to um, enforce anything. You know, you have a lot of people that are watchdogs, right? Yeah, groups like ours, we are always on the lookout. My name is Anthony Gutierrez. I'm the executive director of Common Cause Texas. Watchdog groups like Common Cause Texas monitor what elected officials do and how they spend their donations. It falls to groups like ours and just to, you know, Texans that are concerned about these types of uh, issues. Common Cause often looks closely at big issues like gun reform or climate change and follows the money, especially to see if candidates are getting donations from groups with a stake in those issues. They're also so on watch to see whether candidates use donations for personal gain. It's usually you know, something happens that makes us think there's something suspicious going on here. Um, like, for instance, I've seen office holders or, or candidates who are not yet elected to office, but they write books and then go on a book tour. Sometimes they'll sort of intermix the two, like they're doing a campaign event while they're selling their books at the event. and. Yeah, there are potential ways that that could violate campaign finance laws. While the Texas Ethics Commission and the San Antonio City Clerk's Office don't review candidates' finances, they do take complaints. The investigation isn't initiated unless we receive a complaint, and anybody in Texas can file a complaint with the Texas Ethics Commission. In San Antonio, an ethics auditor reviews a local complaint to see whether it warrants an investigation and gives the candidate a chance to respond. If there's a violation, there could be a fine. It's a similar process at the state level, but someone has to scrutinize those campaign finance reports first. The way the system's set up in Texas, it's pretty easy for an office holder to raise a ton of money and not use that money for its intended purposes, for campaigning or for office holder expenses, like for them to use it on themselves in a lot of ways. So what happens to the money once a campaign is over? They can continue to collect donations after the election. As long as somebody continues to file those two reports each year and disclose any activity out of that segregated campaign account, they can uh, maintain those contributions indefinitely. That's win or lose. An elected official at the state level has to submit those finance 
reports twice a year. In San Antonio, it's four times a year, and contribution limits still apply after a campaign is over. If a candidate or elected official decides to end their political career and they still have money in their campaign account, Texas spells out how they can get rid of it. They can give it to their political party, the state, a charity, a college for a scholarship program, back to the people who donated, or to a PAC or a candidate. And that candidate can be themselves for another office. What he could do is make a contribution to another campaign. If that other campaign happens to be his own, he can do that. But it's also that money would be subject to whatever the contribution limits are for that other seat. Who gets to hold those seats is decided by voters. And it's also up to voters to follow the money that gets candidates there. It is a terrible system, but that's kind of that's what you get when the politicians are making the rules for themselves. So what do you want to see explained? Scan this QR code to take you to the KSAT Explains page. That's where you can find all of our stories and a place where you can submit your own KSAT Explains ideas. We'll be right back.